Welcome to Agile to Agility Podcast with Milan Bayic. Major show alert! The very first value we wrote is individuals and interactions. Let's take this to another level. If I drop my car off Monday at a shop and I don't get it back till Friday, I haven't had my car for five days. Now you're telling me, well, it was only on the lift for 50 minutes. What do I care? I don't care if it was on the lift for how long it was on the lift. I didn't have my car for five days. So sometimes we're measuring it from our perspective rather than putting ourselves in the customer's shoes. Who is Carmen Diardo? What's been your journey? <laughs> Hi, so I, I've been pretty fortunate to have an interesting journey. Um, I started my career at Bell Labs, actually. Um, and I spent, you know, about 25 years in the telecom industry, um, doing some mm -hmm. things that probably seem a little antiquated now, like 800 service. Although it it's still going to some level. Um, huh. And other, you know, network capabilities, messaging, um, so I got the benefit of kind of working in that environment, learned a lot about Deming, you know, Shuhart started at Bell Labs in his mm -hmm. career, 25, I think it was, a little before me. But um, then kind of after the telecom, you know, bust, I went um, contracting for a few years and then I ended up at Nationwide Insurance uh, here in the U.S. Um, and I was fortunate to sort of get involved when they were in them doing some agile lean devops kind of journey um and that's where i actually we became customers at task stop that's where i got to meet mick and some of the people mick kirsten who had founded task stop um in 2007 and you know got to meet got involved with kind of through a relationship with ibm that we you know, we partnered with Gene Kim and the DevOps Enterprise Summit. I kind of just fell into those things mm -hmm. by luck. Uh, and so a few years ago, about, I guess it's about three and a half now, I decided to join TaskTop to help other customers um, on their journey, um, which was really at that point become became more around, you know, value stream management, you know, and utilizing DevOps practices and Agile and Lean to improve delivery end to end. So that's what I've been doing for the last um, three and a half years here at TaskTop. Nice. And you have a book I want to talk about uh, that you've co-written, Standing yes. on Shoulders, A Leader's Guide to Digital Transformation. I haven't read it yet. I ordered it. Um, I've kind of looked through some stuff and some of the topics from the book, but I'm really looking forward to uh, reading it as well. And uh, looking at the reviews, uh, uh, people seem like enjoy it. And, and it, uh, it seems to resonate with people, especially when it comes to holistic transformation. So, Yeah, I... I have the copy of the book here. It's it's a book I, Jack Marr and I wrote. Um, I worked with Jack at, I met Jack at Nationwide and um, it won the DevOps.com 2020 DevOps book of the year or mm -hmm. some kind of book of the year. Um, <laughs> it, um, we, it has a lot of the stories and what's interesting, I guess, is I found even at Bell Labs, you know, obviously last century DevOps wasn't a thing, but uh, we were doing things that were, I think, in the principle of what DevOps came to be. So uh, I actually went back and resurrected some stories from Bell Labs, which I find interesting. So, yeah, hopefully uh, people pick it up. They'll find it useful. So I'll be interested. Yeah, maybe it. we'll get it. I would love to... Uh maybe for you to share a couple of those stories. Um, also, uh, maybe just to, uh, uh, one of the things that I picked up, which is your forward um, by Gene Kim. And uh, uh, one of the first sentences, uh, he's uh, describing you and he said, his humility and singular focus on modernizing architectural and technical practices at Nationwide stood out to him. 
Um, what do you mean by that? As far as I know, humility part, but I think, you know, when we talk about architecture and technical practices and modernizing those inside a large insurance company is enormous task. And I'm assuming when we are talking about architectural practices, it includes business architecture as well, not just IT architecture, or is it more focused on IT architecture? Um, it's probably more on IT, but I think it does bleed into business. I think, I think the thing that struck me, you know, when I, when I first came in the doors at Nationwide, which was 2005, I I'd been hired essentially to try to help operationalize Agile. So as somebody put it, Agile was kind of being done as a hobby rather than a practice. Mm -hmm. Right? It's like, well, we'll do an Agile project. And that was <laughs> good. And they had a vendor. But then when it was over, there was nothing left in the environment. And and really, the thing that struck me was, and I, I guess it took me a while to realize this, right? In Bell Labs, we had been working in a product mindset, right? We had products. We had switching mm -hmm. products. We had the 800 product. We had and everything at Nationwide was projects. I mean, there was legions of project managers. And I remember application owners telling me they couldn't keep control of their applications, their systems, because they were being tugged and pulled. And we were using Clarity and we had people, you know, 10 hours on this project. <laughs> uh -huh. and, and so what struck me was just how different things were. So really, a lot of my focus was trying to get people to think more about things from a product perspective. Now, it turns out that's where, you know, my experience with Mick joined up because Mick's book is project to product. So a lot of the <laughs> discussions that we had, I was actually comparing how things had been done at Bell Labs compared to how they were being done at Nationwide. And what I found then through my involvement with Gene and DevOps Enterprise Summit was, well, that was the norm, right? Nationwide was the norm, not Bell Labs. Mm -hmm. and, and what I found was a lot of people were trying to look at things more holistically, which is, you know, kind of what the heart of DevOps and Lean are, is optimize the whole. It's the first way that Gene talks about in the Phoenix Project. And it can be a lonely experience when you're, one of the few people at the company who are trying to think this way. And I had help at, it was a nationwide and I did talks with Cindy Payne and Jim Grafmeyer and Dan Ritchie and other folks, but you know, Alan Beal is from Maine, but um, uh. it, you know, it, Gene was allowed us to commiserate with other people who are going on this journey mm -hmm. and, and, you know, what was working and what wasn't and being able to use those experiences and those stories became invaluable. I think to some of us, especially if you go back to the 2014 uh, conference when, you know, it was much smaller, more intimate than what it eventually, you know, thanks to the success gene had an IT revolution grew into. And so mm -hmm. you, know, you got to meet just some amazing uh, people from other organizations, Topo Paul from Capital One and Courtney Kistler and Heather Mickman and, you know, the list goes on. I'm going to leave out names and get people <laughs> more. But uh -huh. um, I, I just think my sense was always trying to get people to think, I used to call it think horizontally, right? Mm -hmm. Think more holistically. Think about it from the experience of the customer and who is your customer. And I think what we find is, especially if you're on a, you know, most of the products, if you will, companies have are not external customer facing. They're shared services. They're like billing systems and client, you know, if you're insurance, billings, claims, things like that, or client communication, or when then you have your platform systems and mm -hmm. people don't tend to think of those as products and they don't tend to architect them for flow or speed and sometimes not even sure who their customers are right i i have this um 
scenario I call the Jersey syndrome, which is where we take these high level OKRs. So I, I use a lot uh-huh. of analogies for better. Or worse. But like, let's say a team has a, wants to sell more merchandise, right? Yeah. So they want to sell more of their jerseys, right? It could be a rug, you know, a soccer team, a football team, whatever. You don't want to go to like, you know, your offensive linemen or your defenders and say, what's our goal this year, coach? Oh, we want to sell more jerseys. Like, well, what are you saying? You want me to go out <laughs> by the stadium and wear jerseys? What are you saying? Well, obviously, obviously, right, what the, you want is to do something better to make the team successful so that people, you know, want to wear and buy your merchandise. But I think sometimes we take these high-level OKRs like customer retention or customer expansion. Well, if you're mm-hmm. talking about a platform team, that means nothing, right? Platform teams need to understand, well, who are your customers? Well, my customers are developers or testers or people who need environments, who need monitoring set up. Okay, what are your goals? Well, it might be, you know, automating these capabilities, you know, mm-hmm. providing more self-service capabilities. And so I think what gets lost sometimes is, is, you know, the fact that we have a lot of these internal systems or products that also have customers, they're internal customers, and they need to focus on flow and business value and all the same things that, you know, the customer facing systems do. And I think that's, that's one of the things that we try to get people to, to see, to think more end to end around you know, what's really getting in your way and how do you think more horizontally to, to, yeah. to value more quickly? And that's why I asked Rick around uh, architecture because uh, it requires to look at the whole organization, not just IT architecture, but business architecture and say like, okay, how are we actually structured? And how is that value flowing or how, you know, how is, how, how far horizontally do we see? Sometimes you might be looking horizontally too, but not all end to end, not seeing a full picture. Um, but, you know, I've worked with a lot of insurance companies to, uh, and it's in banks. And they, I don't know if you see the similar pattern in a sense, the challenges, but like with a lot of legacy systems, usually people that have been there for a long time, um, uh, resistance to structural changes or people just say, you know, they would be like, Milan, I've seen this wave come through. I'm just going to ride this way before Agile there was something else. Right. And it seems like in the last 15, 20 years, I mean, stuff has changed, but not much has changed. And going back to your uh, title of the book, Standing on uh, Shoulders, um, you know, it's almost like we haven't really uh, uh, embraced those fundamental lessons that we've learned from Toyota, from, you know, just companies that have embraced more of that product-based thinking and helped our employees to, I still work with clients that it's, you know, same issues that we dealt with, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago. And I don't know if you've seen that. I don't know what your thought is on just that mindset and, and structural architectural change and switching from that project or silos and functions to more of a end-to-end value stream, product-based, whatever you want to call it. Sure. No, I think you're exactly right. I mean, you know, there's terms now, I mean, safe terms. And I think the team topologies, the work that uh, has been done there by, um, oh gosh, no. Yeah, I know exactly. Manuel, (laughs) Manuel, um, you know, about operational value streams and development value streams, right? And if you look Mm -hmm. at it from a customer experience, you know, they have their operational value stream, right? So my car, you know, we had a famous example of a, of a hurricane that turned into a flood. And, and so there's a lot of flooded car claims. So what's, you know, you want people to use the web, you know, the, the direct to, to and not be calling and using all your human resources to get these claims in. So there's many systems, right? They're going to call in and they're going to say, I have a claim. And then, you know, as they go through their process, they're going to hit many systems as part of their journey through the operational value stream. You start to actually look at all those systems and are they really optimized 
end to end. I mean, typically they're not. And mm -hmm. so um, that's where we try to get people to think more broadly around what is the experience of your customer, whether again, you're an external product or an internal product and where is you know the work and i think an important concept here is sometimes we talk about lean and utilization and we think about keeping people busy well people will always stay busy <laughs> again but people are going to be busy it's not where people are waiting it's where work is waiting mm -hmm. and work you know that's invisible it's not like a a car you know, production plant where you can go up to the fourth or fifth floor, look down and see, oh, this inventory is piled up here. And, you know, in software, that's a lot harder. So what we try to get, get people to think about is where is the work waiting? Where is the work building up? Because that's what lead from your customer experience. Mm -hmm. you know, that's what they're experiencing. And then and, you know, it's, it, it's an interesting conversation sometimes because we'll, we'll try to talk about something like flow time and like, you know, what's your flow time from beginning to end? And people will say, oh, well, we get everything done in two weeks. <laughs> like, well, OK, does your customer actually get things in two weeks? Well, no, but I don't want to start the clock earlier or stop it later. That'll make us look bad. Right. And I'll say. <laughs> And I'll, I'll use this car example. I'll say, well, you know, if I drop my car off Monday at a shop and I don't get it back till Friday, I haven't had my car for five days. Now you're telling me, well, it was only on the lift for 50 minutes. What do I care? I don't care if it was on the lift for how long it was on the lift. I didn't have my car for five days. So sometimes we're measuring it from our perspective rather than putting ourselves in the customer's shoes and say, okay. I'm without a car five days. It took five days. Where are the wait times, right? Mm -hmm. What can we do to speed up those times in order to improve the delivery? And, and, you know, I think a lot of these practices are necessary, but they're not sufficient. And so we've become very good at kind of the local optimization. And the that goes back to the structure, are, right? Uh, right. That goes back to the structure of the organization. If I'm incentivized uh, for that, and like we've focused so much on uh, productivity, where we've optimized, like like you said, you know, one area, but not really. And when we look at incentives, right? This is another right. thing in organizations like that hasn't really changed much, but we incentivize uh, individuals. I had some <laughs> recently uh, tell me uh, uh, executive, like, you know, Milan, I know, but you know, I got kids uh, in college. I know what's right, but I got kids in college and this is what I'm incentivized. Uh, so a lot of times you see people, they get it, but the system and the policies are, essentially directing their behavior towards something that's not necessarily the best for the company long term. So how uh, how have you maybe a nationwide or with other clients, how have you been able to help leaders? Because I think a lot of times leaders are just not fit for for the job. It's almost like that Peter principle, right? Like they haven't been, they've been promoted, but they've really, they're not, you know, systems thinkers. They're not really thinking. And for those that are kind of, they get it. They don't have the support uh, that they need in order to do the right things. Yeah, I think you hit on the key point. We used to have a saying that, you know, the technology is the easy part. The culture is the hard part. And, mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, at one point I can remember in my career, I was working with 21 areas that were kind of different business areas. And, and somebody said, you know, you, you can't get tw the 21 leaders there to agree on the day of the week, right? How are you going to get it <laughs> to happen? And I said, well, I don't need 21 people. I just need one. Because, I mean, I'm a believer that if you can get one example and build stories. And I used to try to tell stories from other companies and that can have diminishing returns, right? Because first you'd get the story, well, we're not a unicorn. <laughs> well, okay, but then I would use Topo Paul stories from Capital One when he was there. But I mean, people need to see it happening in their own environment. 
Those are the mm-hmm. stories that stick, right? There's a book I think that talks about that stick. It's a, written by a bunch of, by brothers. I, I'm not going to remember names, but making it, make it stick. I think was it called. But I mean, those stories are powerful. Mm-hmm. So, so you know, if you smart, I believe you start small. You kind of you know, Dominica de Grandis, who uh, I have the privilege of working with here, Tastop calls it the coalition of the willing, and mm-hmm. and you have to have leadership support. Right. But but find one area, two areas where you can start to create these stories or and experiences. I, I guess, you know, stories are related right. to experiences. Right. and uh, uh. Right. So like we I can remember the first time we were working with an area and they were able to, to release on a Tuesday. After morning or something, and we. Oh, you just went on mute. I guess I wasn't moving yeah. anything long enough. My screen <laughs> kicked in. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. But so we used to like create um, experiment. We called them experiments, and the the focus was really on accelerating the delivery of value. Right, that was the only thing we were focused on. We had done other things on lean and cost and quality and all those things but we were saying what is it we asked the question in in retrospectives very specifically what's causing you not to be able to go faster not just what can we do better it's like very specific what's in our way and so then we would design experiments and do show and tells and these show and tells became pretty popular other people would come other leaders would come and and you know they would show and you know sometimes most almost most of the time they were successful sometimes they weren't but that was okay it was an experiment we were trying Mm -hmm. it and then you know having those stories from those experiences and i can remember the first time we did the show and tell around a team that delivered in in, on a tuesday and there were some people getting somewhat emotional about the fact it was the first time in their 10 12 year career they didn't have to spend a weekend away from their family doing a release Right. And, you know, they could do these releases. And so then other business leaders said, well, hey, you know, Janet's area, they did a release on a Tuesday. What the heck? You've been telling me for years I can only get it on the second one Saturday of the month. And so those stories became very powerful. You know, we had people from other I had managers come to me and say, Carmen, all my people want to go work for these two teams now. And it's like, well, you know, we can fix that. Right. We can get you going and so and and it, i'm not saying it's easy but if you know but i think like you, you know that's been yeah my experience too like just getting people because like you can say and share stories from other companies sometimes that helps just to you know bring people in but ultimately you don't change your mindset you know of anybody they change or culture culture is a result you know not something in my opinion uh, not something that you know you can immediately change it's a result of changing the systems uh, changing the mindset changing the practices um but uh when we look at that change and when we look at that uh uh kind of holistic view and changing the culture changing the uh, leadership mindset um it is really through that, uh, through that experience. And like, if you think about anything in life too, you know, like look at, you know, what COVID taught us in a sense of like, <laughs> you know, things that I thought like, you know, that will be doing interviews like this and uh, teaching, you know, and my mindset and my approach has changed and probably it's changed the culture across the globe around, you know, so uh, an experience or event can be, done quickly or can last long is what creates, in my opinion, that change. So when it comes to transformations uh, in organizations, what have you seen work? Is it really those experiences? Uh, What about, you know, leadership mindset and, uh, you know, um, what role does it play? Like what type of leaders you have and their understanding of what needs to happen? Yeah, that's a great question. I I mean, you obviously have to have like I said, you know, talked about that story Does leadership support at some level or some minimum amount, right. To get things going. And I don't think people really do understand 
leadership and especially systems thinking. I think sometimes leaders fall into the trap of, well, if I'm the leader, I should be driving the best way to do things. I should be the expert. I should be the one setting forth, you know, the process improvement initiatives. Mm-hmm. But, but, you know, I'm a firm believer in Deming's view that the people closest to the work actually have the best ideas. You know, it's the concept of quality circles. And what leadership is about is allowing those teams to be able to try things, you know, set up the guardrails, right? Mm-hmm. Set up some conditions to be able to try things and then harvest, you know, what works, you know, and operationalize those things. So, for example, you know, it, what I see a lot of times is a mechanical approach to like DevOps. It's like, well, if automated testing is good for team, you know, A, it's good for everybody. Well, <laughs> I'm not going to say it's not good, but maybe that's not where the issue is, right? It's like, you know, I use the example. It's like taking a bus of people to the doctor and they all come up with the same prescription. <laughs> Probably, that's, it, you know, do we really understand what teams need and then give them options? You know, the DevOps capabilities, you know, improvements in people process technology should be available. The full menu should be available based on what the need is. And so good leaders allow their teams, you know, to be, to experiment and then operationalize those results. And they understand the difference between what's a systemic issue and what is a special case. I mean, a lot of times I think we react to special cases as if they're systemic. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, doing operational reviews you can look and say, okay, what is systemic here? For example, too much WIP. We see too much WIP most times it's systemic across organizations. Mm-hmm. Um, we start a lot of things, they get stopped, so then we start more stuff. We talk about a pool model, but really, if you're an internal system or shared sys- service, work's getting pushed on you, you're not the one committing to it. That's what I was going to say, like, you know, coming back to what you said about the Toyota or the lean system where you can visualize it, like, you know, in a lot of what we do, it's not visualized. So the first thing is like, you know, can we visualize to see where those bottlenecks are? Uh, I work with a lot of clients and they don't even know that, you know, they just manage stuff in Jira or some other tool, but they don't really have any clue in a sense of what's really going on and where the bottlenecks are. So could we maybe talk about um, that like visualizing work, the importance, I think that's another that goes back to the <laughs> kind of the basics and standing this uh, visualizing work is not something that agile community invented. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's yeah. something that's been around, but it's still something that I think most companies are not really good at and understanding where the bottlenecks are, you know, first part is understanding, um, you know, visualizing work and then understanding truly where the bottlenecks are. No, that's a great question. I mean, we, we talk a lot with our clients about like three phases, learn to see, learn to improve, learn to scale. And the mm-hmm. first thing, and I think we see this a lot of time, people jump into learn to improve, you know, before learn to see. It's kind of like mm-hmm. you would, if you've ever done an A3, right, the left-hand side is the problem and the right-hand side is the countermeasures. And people start with the countermeasures. Like, no, <laughs> you understand what the problem is. And so- uh-huh. You know, learn to see, I mean, you know, what we do, and we have a product. I know this is not an advertisement, but I'm not oh, it's okay. It. But, you know, our Viz product allows you to connect to the various tools where work is done, right? So the agile management tools, the service management tools, the quality management tools, the portfolio management tools, and follows kind of the journey of the work to show you you know, where it's flowing and where it isn't. And because again, it's about the work, right? People will stay busy. And, and so, you know, what we find is most of the time, it's not, you know, what I call, um, you know, dev, dev to cloud. It's not really that part of it anymore, right? It's code to cloud. Um, it's more, a lot of times the bottleneck is, on the work intake side, right? It, it's taking months from a concept to get to the point where 
there's a card in the backlog of a team. I mean, one, one organization we work with, half their time and money was spent before work onto the backlog of a team. So even if they were perfect on the right-hand side of their value stream, they were leaving everything on this left-hand side you know, without any visibility, without any management, without any improvement. So how do you really know where to invest? So what we try to get people, what we try to get them to think about is these concepts around work. And, you know, in the in mixed book, the flow framework, we talk about four types of work, features, defects, risks, and debt. And people understand features and defects, but and risk, we mean things like security and compliance, not project management. So these are things like, mm-hmm. so, you know, a typical example is you'll talk to a, leaders at a company who'll go, well, do you do, you know, security management? Well, yeah, we have tools. We spend millions of dollars. We have tools. We have people certified. We do static scans. We do dynamic scans. Great. How long does it take you to mitigate something from finding a critical, you know, vulnerability and I'm not talking about one like Log4j that makes all the headlines, right? But just a typical scan where you find a bunch of vulnerabilities to you fix it. What's that process like? And they're not very streamlined. It's like, well, security managers run a report. Then, you know, they have meetings. Then they try to beg somebody to fix it, right? Because especially if you're in a project mindset, who wants to pay to upgrade a struts library or something? Nobody, right? So, not, it's not coming out of my project, no, right? No, <laughs> so, so we're, we're checking all the boxes, right? We're doing the activities, right? But we're not looking at the outcomes. Mm-hmm. And so by starting to measure, you know, classify these things, like, well, how do you represent risk in your tooling, right? Is it, is it a, Artifact in Jira or, or, you know, your agile management tool, right? Um, mm-hmm. is, it, is it even visible? Because if it's not visible, then you can't manage it. And then, and then debt is another one, right? Debt is basically anything you're investing to improve in. So it's technical debt, but it's also people process technology. It's implementing a DevOps practice. That's going to take capacity. That has to be prioritized. That has to be visible. Mm-hmm. Most of the organizations, when we start to work with, the risk and the debt work are not visible at all. So it's, and I think then that reflects back to the business, right? They think, okay, if I have a team of X people and two pizza teams or, you know, a bunch of two pizza teams, all they're doing is working on features and maybe the bugs, which I hope they don't create. It's like but no. that's that's I think that's another issue maybe just to dwell a little bit on this because risk and uh, and, and that are seen as IT problems not business problems yeah, and, and really they, they're business yeah. problems not IT problems That's a great insight I'm going to use I'm going to start <laughs> on that I think you're right it, it is seen that way that you know these you know these are business problems but but again, it's like, I mean, they're IT problems, but, you know. It, well, the, it's, I think the reason that I say that it's the ignorance of saying, like, not understanding it, not understanding the business uh, risk of it. If I don't invest in DevOps, if I don't invest in these risks, and it's easy. And most of the, like, uh, most of the people on the business side don't fully understand these things. So it's easy to say, I don't own it this is somebody else's problem. They need to take care of it rather than understanding it. You might not be expert on it, but like investing in it, prioritizing it, that needs to come from business in my opinion. Uh, And at least (laughs) in a support uh, rather than just focusing on the shiny things. But. Oh, I agree. Yes. And I, I think that is, that is a key element. We talk about value generation versus value protection, right? So if you look at value generation, people think of features, but actually mm-hmm. debt is, an, is a component of value generation because debt is an investment to deliver value fat more quickly. So if you, if you invest in debt, you're actually investing in value generation. Value protection is around defects, but also risk. And it doesn't do you any good to generate value if you can't protect it. Right, because you can get customers, but if they're going to leave because you know PCI, PII vulnerability exposure, mm-hmm. what have you gained there or compliance issues? So, you know, I talk about it sometimes, like 
a individual needs a balanced diet. Systems need a balance of, you know, and, and that's in, you know, mixed flat in the flow framework, it's flow distribution. So we show people, well, here is your flow distribution of what you're delivering across features, defects, risks, and debt. And most of the time, companies aren't even investing 5% in debt and risk. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, that's a conversation to have with the, as you said, with the product owner, the product manager, the business side. Are you comfortable with this? You know, I use the example of I take a fleet of trucks and I'm going to do a cross country delivery and I beat, you know, I beat the, I don't maintain the trucks. I beat the crap out of them. My drivers are all, you know, working all the time. Maybe I make my delivery to California from Maine, but who wants to be the next person to take over the, you know, this, this fleet. <laughs> those, and those systems are what gives you, in the end, it's those systems that bring you recurring value, right? Mm-hmm. Projects come and go, initiatives come and go. What's, you know, what's permanent is the systems and you have to, you know, you have to do the adequate care feeding of these systems. And I think that's what gets lost. So, well, I think it's also down. visualizing. So maybe uh, like I want to spend a little bit of time. I want to talk to you about value sh- uh, streams, value stream mapping. But like another thing, a fundamental thing that I see almost everybody struggle with is answering, you know, what is value? We talk about delivering value. We talk about value streams. We talk about value stream mapping. But when you ask people what is value, they just give you a blank stare. Right. So how do you define value? How do you help people when they say like, oh, we value this or we value that? Uh, Obviously, it's not just one thing. It could be looked at from many different. But from your perspective, how would you answer that question? How could organization look at how they define value? Yeah, that's I mean, when I'm talking to a team and again, right? There can be an external, it can be an external product, an internal product or a platform product. The, one of the first questions we ask them, and it's one of those things, you know, again, that's in the MIG talks about a lot is, is value. And so I'll say to them, okay, put yourself, why are, do you exist? Why do customers care? If you went away tomorrow, who would miss you and why would they miss you? Mm-hmm. Right? Because that's how you're being valued. And, and you're right, a lot of times it's crickets, especially if you're with a platform team. We'll say, okay, what is the value you provide, right? It's not, again, it doesn't have to do with insurance policies or financial or whatever you're selling. If you're in a car, it's not about the cars you're selling, right? It's about, you know, monitoring, how much, you know, monitoring and, and environment set up and self-service capability. So, one of the first things that we do is try to get people to think about who are your customers and why do they value you? Why do they care? Who would miss you if you went away and get them in their own words, you know, to, to talk about what is value and how should it be measured? Because if you don't understand that, then how do you know that what you're doing, it doesn't do you any good to improve flow if it actually isn't improving value. Exactly. And we're talking about customer value, but we could look at it, you know, that's another thing that's part of, in my opinion, of business value, but you could look at, you know, from a risk, let's just say insurance companies are very risk averse, very, so like value could be that, Hey, we don't have our data compromised or that whatever it is that we, you know, we have high confidence in, 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 in that part, but like just having discussion, typically understanding and communicating. One of the biggest challenges that I see is like product owners can't really communicate what business value is. And it can change and it can, you know, over the year, whatever it is, but just a common understanding of what is currently valued for this you know, thing. Right. So what we do, and we can do this in, our, in the, this product, is we get each product to enter various things. You know, we have value, cost, quality, and then happiness of the team. Mm-hmm. Because I, you know, happy happy teams are productive and productive teams are happy. If a team isn't happy, there's something off the track there, right? Either there, there's too much whip. They're not spent getting time to focus on technical debt. They're working with a fragile code base. And so, you know, we get, we work a lot to get them to, to quantify what are those things that they're, 
they're going to measure and then look at how the flow, you know, correlates with what's happening there to make sure that we are on track, that, you know, we're moving the needles in the right direction in terms of what means the most to the customers of this product. Again, no matter if it's a platform product or an external, you know, facing product. Mm -hmm. Um, But those conversations, I mean, a lot of what we're doing here is trying to have the data to drive the right conversations, Mm -hmm. right? For the team themselves to be able to say, what do we think, again, is keeping us from going faster? Well, we show them, you know, various places where they have bottlenecks in their system. You know, it could be is that market. through like value stream mapping or like in what ways do you show, how do you expose the system in those bottlenecks? So what we, what we do is, you know, we start out with a conversation with the customer about what artifacts in your tools represent features, defects, risks, and that, right? So features might be, you know, epics and features and stories and things that start somewhere on the left-hand side, right? And flow mm-hmm. through the agile management and eventually go through a release. And, and you know, we, we are able to connect to the most popular tools that companies use to identify those artifacts and map the states into either active or waiting or done states. And then actually show them the journey of their artifacts through their value stream network and say, okay, here is where, you know, features spend the most time. Like, for example, you were talking about, you know, uh, before you were talking about customers and backend systems and legacy systems. We were working Mm -hmm. with a company that had a new um, financial product and they were, you know, they had front end teams and it's highest priority. And we started looking at their work and, and we're saying, okay, well, you know, this, you have this big in progress step, but what's really happening? And they're saying, well, some of our stories go to these other team. I go, well, okay, let's see, let's bring their work into it. And we found there's some legacy system no one's paying attention to that's completely has too much work in progress. And there's this long wait states around, you know, release certification. And not only was this product's work sitting there, but they were serving like 20 other products. And so everybody was suffering or being impacted by these delays in the release of this legacy system that no one was caring about, no one was investing in. It was on some two-year improvement roadmap, but it was like, you can pull all the money you want to these front-end teams. Nothing's going to happen unless you start to pay attention to this back-end system. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that that's where we see a lot of. So in a way, you use your tools essentially to paint the picture to your customers in a sense, what's going on. And <laughs> here's really what's happening. And uh, it's almost you're mapping the, the the how values form where the oh, I think it's also looking at dependencies, I'm assuming. Yeah. Uh, and uh, not just where the bottlenecks are, but the, the, the you can identify dependencies. Uh, yeah, well. I, I think most companies, you know, and I, I put something on LinkedIn about this yesterday about value stream networks. And and I remember Mick talking about this when he was on a plane ride once to, to see me in Columbus. He said he was looking at the map, you know, of all the hubs and all the routes. And he goes, you know, this is sort of like how work flows through companies right if you're a large company and you have thousands of systems mm-hmm. it's kind of messy right and we probably didn't design it it wasn't designed intentionally it started out where this system needs to talk to this system and this they have to talk here and pretty soon you end up with this very complicated network of you know how work is broken down and you know okay i have to do an initiative i need work from a billing system i may need work from a yeah. Oh, here we go again. Um, I need work from all these dependent systems. And if you can't see that network, you can't, you don't understand, you know, where things are piling up at other places. So, 
So well, that's the first thing. I mean, like, so I agree. And it, it kind of, you know, uh, naturally kind of grows into this mess. But this yeah. this points back to now you can even see it and you see all this mess and you might fix that mess for five years. But ultimately, if you don't have a way or if those coming back to the leaders in a sense, and I see those leaders almost also as part of being architects, organizational architects, not just IT architects, understanding the lean and and some of the systems thinking, complexity management fundamentals and being able to manage or uh, lead through those systems uh, so that you don't get in the same situation 10 years from where you are. And I think it's like, you know, it's uh, generally like, oh, let's bring in the consultants. Let's have them, you know, uh, tell us what to do. They're going to give us a playbook and then we'll be all set rather than saying, I need to know as much as these consultants now in order to not get us in the situation that we're in right now. Exactly. So, you know, we talked... So we talk about value stream management, which is now a new discipline that, you know, Forrester has created a new category um, that encompasses a lot of these concepts of lean and value stream mapping, but does it in a more automated way by pulling information from the tools themselves that are supposed to, right, represent how work is actually done. I, I used to joke sometimes that, you know, because I did a lot of value stream mapping and it was sort of like, how we wish work was done, how we <laughs> hoped work was done, but it really wasn't how work was done. Well, we're showing them now, based on the journeys of these artifacts and their states, how work is actually being done. And then, you know, we want to train them. You know, we are not consultants right now. If they want to use a consultant or a partner, we have partners, that's great. We want that. But but they need to take ownership. I mean, I will tell people, I'm not going to come in and tell you what to do. How, what the heck do I know? You have Your people know more about how to fix, you know, improve things than me, right? So what we're trying to do is train them to utilize the capabilities that they have and unleash it. And, and it is at multi-level. So you have the teams themselves in their retros that have to be able to start to ask, you know, what's keeping us from going faster, running an experiment. Experiment could be a DevOps practice, people process technology, something. Measure the, you know, experiment has to have three things, a goal, an activity, but you also have to wait to measure its success. Mm -hmm. Because I've seen people argue after something was over, if it was successful or not. It's like... If you know, well, there's that too. I think measure, you know you, you, the success is defined differently from each you know kind of perspective. But another thing that we make an assumption is that people actually want to do this stuff, right? Like we talk about self management and, and people taking ownership of continuous improvement, but in reality, <laughs> it's like you know scrum masters are and like you know these chain champions are the only ones that are excited about a lot of times about change and taking ownership. Um, so it goes back to that culture and mindset where like you actually have to create a culture and mindset where people do want to take ownership. It's not like when we talk about value stream management, I'm assuming we're talking about, like you said, on multiple levels and people being able to manage that, that you know, how that value is flowing, understanding where the bottlenecks are and going back again to those basics. Right. So, that yes, it's multi level. So then we also have what we call VSM for leaders, right? So most companies have something called like an operational review or some kind of review. They do them every month. You know, um, they need to be looking at, you know, their, you know, the, we call them the, the flow metrics, as Mick has defined. They have to be looking at these flow and business results. And, and the leaders have to be looking at the systemic problems that they own, right? So if, I have an, so if I'm a leader and I can look at my metrics and I see that across the board, we're not investing in security and debt, that's my problem. That's my mm -hmm. problem to solve with my leaders. That's not the teams, right? The teams will eventually be impacted. That's a systemic problem, right? If I have too much work in progress across the board, that's my problem to deal with with my leaders. So let now, me ask you this then, because uh, I've asked this others. So the, the leader that you just described, based on your experience, what percentage of leaders do you currently see that act from that perspective in organizations or with your clients? What would be rough percentage if you had to guess? It's low. 
<laughs> That's I why mean, I ask. It's and, probably uh, less than, I mean, I think some people, and I'm, it's not that they're not capable, right? I'm, I don't, uh, I don't want to come across uh, like, well, I, <laughs> no, there's, these people are smarter than me probably, right? It's just that they're, the culture is not such, right, that they're motivated or incentivized to ask those questions. Um, and so in practice, I see this being done almost hardly ever, right, where there, especially where there's a focus on, on flow and, and accelerating delivery, right? It's more. That, that's why, on, yeah. And that's why we're I ask. Implement, <laughs> say, right. We're going to implement something. So we we're good at saying, well, let's implement agile. Let's bring in consultants. Let's implement safe. And those are all great things. And those are all necessary. But as far as actually systems thinking, I mean, I have decks on Deming that I use that are 30 years old and they still apply. Right, because and it's not you know there's knowledge and there's ability. The reason that I brought up this question is because I, I think you know uh, uh, many people that I consider experts, including yourself. Like when I ask, like, what is necessary for a leader to know? What is can you actually have a successful organization without these leaders? And everybody's like, no, <laughs> right? And then I ask, how many of these leaders? What's the rough percentage that you see? And everybody's pretty low. So what is that, that telling us about the industry and how far? agile has progressed how far organizations have matured because if if it really hasn't like we kind of know what it what's required uh you need to change leadership mindset you have to leaders that have to be capable of understanding how they systematically change the organization how and yet that you know we're saying what we need is not there yet and uh, I see some signs, and I think maybe in 10 years, <laughs> we'll, we'll have a different conversation. But short term, I think it's, it's challenging. And it's challenging for people in organizations, because those are the people that can unlock and almost unleash the people in their organizations. And it's not happening. I don't know if COVID's going to trigger that, but what is your thought on that? Do you agree that, you know, you see my point as far as like what's needed versus <laughs> what Absolutely. we actually see? Absolutely. Right. And I go back to some of the things we discussed already where I've seen this be successful is where, you know, you can have a partnership between that business and IT leader and set the example and almost like put the rest of the organization to shame. I mean, I hate yeah. to put it that way, but almost... <laughs> To the point where it's obvious that that you know these people got something going here, and and they need to pay attention now. And you know it can turn pretty quickly when you that inertia comes, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, but it's really you got to get those first couple of success stories, um, and then you have to be able to advertise them. I used to beg people I worked with to tell their stories. I go, they don't want to hear me or my team. They want to hear, we need to hear you tell your story. Mm -hmm. And it can be infectious one, you know, in a good way once you get this going, but you know, you have to, you have to get those, those leaders and their teams and those stories. And then that's, what's going to impact the culture um, because you know, people are naturally then going to be drawn to it. And, and, you know, I have seen, I talk about when you know you're successful is when you've changed cynicism into hope, right? As you said, <laughs> people are cynical. They're Carmen this is the flavor of the month. When those people then start to get hopeful, that's when you know you got something, right? And that's when you can start to impact the culture. And it, and it isn't easy and it's a journey. That's why I don't even really, we mean transformations in, in our book title, one, you know, but it's really a journey and, it's an, and it doesn't end, right? It's continually striving to get better as part of, you know, that plan, do, check, act, shoe heart cycle, whatever you want to call it, continuous improvement. And you know, I, well, same I, as, I, as, you know, you can call personal, like, you know, hopefully we're transforming throughout our life, 
I'm not the same person that I was, but it is a journey. It's more of a journey than transformation. Transformation is almost, uh, uh, you know, the artifact or like something that that, that is uh, happening. But the journey is the, the, something that you take on. And it's it's uh, uh, so, yeah, no, I mean, th- that's that's what concerns me in a sense. And like creating those experiences, telling those stories and when we're too busy, um, to just not seeing the work, not, uh, not seeing where the bottlenecks are. It's easy to confuse being busy for actually getting stuff done. And I see that a lot too. And which goes back to what we talked about, you know, at the beginning about not knowing, um, what else, uh, from your perspective around this topic, uh, you think, uh, is important to know around uh, the journey or transformation. Like what have you seen works well? Um, you know, what has worked at nationwide and um, other uh, besides, you know, things that maybe we didn't discuss yet. Well, I, I mean, I guess I can give you kind of a couple of philosophical points. I mean, what a couple of things I, I tend to, I, you know, you said to folks was, don't always look at what how much more there is to be done because that can get people depressed. Like we should be better, right? We could be better. Why aren't we better? Sometimes you have to look at how far you've come, right? And, and you can't let perfect be the enemy of good or getting better. So number one, again, understand it's a journey. Celebrate your successes. We're not good at that. Um, understand there's still work to go. But don't despair because you think, oh, gee, we should be better than this. And, and then I think the second thing I've talked to people about is ideas. Sometimes it's not that an idea is bad. It may just not be ripe. OK, sometimes like the culture isn't ready for this yet. That doesn't mean it's a bad idea. That doesn't mean it can't work later. That just means, OK, this has to stay in the backlog for now. And then, it, you know, the time may come when it's ripe and you can play that card. So don't, you know, I, I talk about patience and perseverance, right? You have to kind of be patient and persevere through this. And, um, you know, that's where I think the community is very important because, you know, if you're in an organization or in a role where you feel kind of like the sheep, you know, the voice in the wilderness, you need... That's where, you know, that's where the organization, you know, the community, you know, Gene Kim, what he did with the DevOps community, other folks can be an inspiration, you know, to try to continue to move forward because it is, it's worthwhile and it's, you know, it's necessary because the companies that are getting this, the gap, I think, between the companies that are getting this and the ones that aren't is growing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, um, you know, I, we don't want we don't want a situation where a few companies are dominating most of you know what's happening from an IT perspective, right? It's healthier for us to have more more organizations, you know, getting this, getting better, being able to improve, being able to compete, and that's part of what motivates me is to try to help them to do that. And it is possible, um, but again, you know, you have to take those steps first steps to get better and you have to commit yourself to that journey. And, and, you know, you have to have some leadership, obviously buy-in to, to help navigate that, but take advantage of, of all the folks that you have on the ideas that they have, because they're very powerful. I, I mean, I remember, I'll just leave you because I know we may be running out of time, but I'll leave you. Uh, no, it's good, yeah. was, was a, a manager came to me and said, you know, they, there was a woman on the, their team that he goes, all of a sudden she has all these great ideas and she, she never said anything. And it's like, well, you know, she had worked at other companies and I think she had re- felt rightly or wrongly like, well, people aren't really interested in my experiences and my ideas. There didn't seem to be any forum to get them out. So, I mean, she, she was very good at doing her work. But now that she saw that people were actually listening and there was a forum, all these ideas started to pour. And, and that was you know, that was not an exception. You saw that a lot. I mean, people 
do don't want to come to work and not have be productive or not have happy customers. Nobody mm-hmm. wants to do that, right? Well, if not have a voice. Uh, yeah. They can do amazing things, but again, that has to come from leadership. Yeah, absolutely. You just remind me, I had this experience. Uh, uh, it was another insurance company and uh, I did this retrospective. It was New England uh, uh, around this time of the year. Um, and I drove to this uh, satellite office and it was intent to do like a, a quarterly retrospective uh, for this uh, group. And I remember one lady saying, Milan, they treat us like mushrooms. And before that, like, I didn't know uh, what she meant. I didn't, I never heard that term before. And she's like, I was like, uh, uh, I, I don't know what you mean. She's like, you know, they keep us in the dark and feed us shit. <laughs> and I was like, you know, and that's the worst thing that you can have. Like, you know, disengage people that feel like they're, you know, uh, not right. being heard, not, uh, uh, not listened to. And uh, uh, these are the people that have been uh, in this instance, this lady was with the company for 20 plus years. She's seen her colleagues being walked out through the front door of the company. And th- there was no way, or it was <laughs> at that point, there was no way that you could engage this group of people to say, try something else. Because at, at that time, they probably had, you know, what we know, <laughs> what we call, uh, you know, change fatigue. It was just like, no, I, I gave up. This is just paying my bills. And uh, unfortunately I see still a lot of that, but um, yeah. it is sad, sad to see in those organizations, uh, you know, people like that. Yeah, it is. It is sad. And I think, you know, a lot of what Gene Kim talks about that motivated him was to try to improve the life of IT workers. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, you know, it is exciting when people start to get it right. And the lights come on. And like I said, that hope, you know, grows out of that cynicism, but, but, you know, it's, it's a journey and people, you know, leaders need to invest now, right? I mean, time is getting shorter and, and the companies that aren't even on this path, you know, are just going to fall further behind. So, you know, I'm excited to try to, to work with organizations and try to get them. And, and really a lot of time, it, it's just really enabling the people who are there and giving them the tools really to make some of this happen, right? Because there's a lot of talent there. It's just, are they really empowered or enabled to make the changes that are needed with, mm. you know, with the right leadership mindset, as you said. Yeah, yeah it is a big part. And uh, maybe the last thing uh, that you can talk about, which I heard you when you did the interview with Mick, um, people want to work in their tool of choice. Could you just elaborate on that? Because I think that's really important because uh, there's a lot of, you know, in a sense, you know, uh, take this tool because of this price or uh, whatever it is or it aligns with this. But what do you mean when you say that people want to work in their tool of choice? So, you know, I think one of the most ignored and probably the most important product that we have is really our pipeline, right? Our development pipeline. We tend not to think it of it that way. We tend to make a lot of decisions around, okay, well, we need an agile management tool. We need a service management tool. We need a quality management tool. Well, but, you know, that is a product, right? If you think about Mm -hmm. your flow of work from identifying an I, you know, and different types of work have different genesis, right? A feature may start in a portfolio with an idea, right? or plan view or tool like that. And then eventually it'll turn into, you know, artifacts that go into your agile management tool. You know, if you have defects, obviously you're you're going to to your quality management. When you're going into deploy and release management, your service management. So there's a flow here and there's really a network of tools that represent that flow of work. And people, you know, a couple of things you don't want to have are multiple versions of the truth. Like, what is the truth? I have an incident in service now, but then I have, I have a defect, you know, associated with, you know, JIRA. Well, 
this says this status, that says that status. Do I have to log into this tool? How many tools do we want our developers to log into? Right, developers really only want to be in three tools. And, and this really came from work I did with Cindy Payne and Jim Grafmeyer nationwide. They want to be in you know, their IDE, right? Their development environment. They want to be in their agile management tool and they and they'll they want to be in Slack or whatever version of you know Slack you have, right? We, Communication, we, we yeah. Have, yeah. We, and and they don't want to have to log into five different tools. Well, you want to see your defects, you're going to go to uh. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> so you want to see your defects, yeah. Yeah, you know, they don't, they don't want to go in and they, you know, they want to want to go into service. Now they don't want to be going into six, seven different tools, right? So so you want to, and that's really where Mick's idea of task talk came about it it was about bringing work to people right to their desktop if you will rather than have them have to search for work so mm -hmm. part of what our products do is is allow these artifacts to flow between these tools but i mean ultimately you know if you're a developer you want to be able to see all your different types of work in front of you you know in your in your JIRA or whatever. If you're a service man, you know, if you're doing change management or incident management, you might want to be in Remedy or Service Now and seeing, and, and you want what you're seeing, your representation of the world to match everybody else's representation of the world. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you know, it's a facade, right? So, so getting people to be able to focus, you know, and be in their tool of choice um, for the work that they're doing right, will allow, allows them to be more productive and effective. And, and as you know, what we try to do with some of our technology is keep everything in sync and, and give you a view of the overall view of work so that, that, you know, other people who are looking at the value stream, you know, value, we call this concept like a value stream architect, although very few companies actually, <laughs> actually call it a value stream architect, but can, can, you know, can look above this and look of the fray and look at the flow and identify, well, yeah, here's our issue. It's taking forever for work on the left-hand side between IDA and where, you know, features and stories are ready to be developed. Or it's all this time we're spending in the release certification to deployment, you know, is where we, we, we need it. Or in an incident, it's all this, you know, maybe it's in the triage or some other part of, of the process that maybe takes a long time. So, yeah. so what we're trying to do is get people more effective in their tool of choice so they can focus on what you know they're trying to do while also making sure that the system is working in an optimum way. And it's mm -hmm. that balance that you really need. And you know, that takes different perspectives and different views of how work is flowing. Uh, is there anything as a last thought or maybe message that you want to share? I mean, I guess, you know, kind of a summary, kind of what we've probably already talked about is no matter whatever situation you're in or other organization, it is, you know, making this journey is possible. Um, I'm not going to say it's easy, but it is possible. And, and, you know, having, yeah, I think leaving people hopeful that um, I've seen companies go through this. And we're working with companies right now to go through it, and and you know we see the successes that can come out of this. So um, no matter where you are, you know, from your whatever landscape, you know, whatever place you find yourself in, you know, it's possible. But you got to start, right? You got to start and commit yourself to this journey of continue, you know, data driven continuous improvement and um, it can happen, but, but again, um, you know, I think, I think you got to start with those small steps and then, and then watch it blossom from there.